Can you hear me? I'm not used to using a handheld mic. Uh, so I'm going to have to perfect my microphone technique. But do shout if you can't, if you can't hear, and I will uh, project a bit more. Um, so yeah, I hope you've all are suitably fed, watered, and caffeinated. Um, uh, hopefully, you're aware that we've got this afternoon workshop. So we're going to hopefully get creative um, and talk about creative approaches to community engagement. Um, so I'll just introduce myself and Stir to Action. So I've got this, this lectern is actually just holding a keyboard so I can, there's nothing else going on here. Um, yeah, so for those of you who, who might not be aware, so um, Steer to Action is one of the, the partners of these events um, with Heritage Trust Network, AHF and Locality. And um, Steer are um, based primarily in Dorset, uh, although I'm based in Manchester, or will, that will be evident in my presentation. <laughs> um, so uh, they're essentially a, an organisation that promotes the democratic economy, democratic organisations. So um, my, my background is in co-ops and community enterprises, and so a lot of what I'll be talking about is about how community engagement, how we engage people to take a stake, have a feeling of ownership, which I think is a really powerful way of engaging communities. And I think in the context of um, the, res you know, the response to the pandemic around mutual aid and community organising, I think there is a really strong opportunity that people do want to be more proactive and take a stake in the organisations, in their neighbourhoods, in their high streets. So that's just a, um, the lens in which this session um, is going to it's going to focus on. So I hope that's, that's okay and isn't too, you know, at odds with how you see your involvement in, in the heritage or in the um, enterprise space. Um, but yeah, just to, just to introduce myself. Um, oh yeah, so I just wanted to say that if, uh, <laughs> if you enjoy this session and you are interested in other sessions looking at the um, new economy, the democratic economy, then actually Stir to Action is about to embark on a, what that's called the new economy programme. So these are online sessions, uh, workshops uh, that run from, I think the first one in fact started, but they run until uh, the summer next year. And there are a number of funded places as well. So you can apply for bursaries and get free places. Um, and they cover a whole series of topics and themes around the democratic new economy. Um, so um, just go on to Stir to Action's website, stirtoaction.com uh, to find out more. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, give a bit of background to my kind of involvement in this space. So um, uh, I suppose my um, uh, introduction to um, uh, community organisation, community engagement, was through uh, working at Corpses UK, uh, and I uh, set up and led a, um, a uh, I suppose, a centre of excellence for community shares called the Community Shares Unit back in 2012. Has anyone, has anyone come across the community shares unit? A few hands. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, so um, I'll talk a little bit more about community shares uh, later on. Um, and uh, following that, we actually, so that was a kind of um, a centre of best practice, providing support, advice, guidance on how to do a community share offer. Uh, and then we worked with other part, we worked with a number of partners, uh, including AHF as well, um, and locality. Um, and in 2016, we actually set up what's called the Community Shares Booster Programme, which is actually uh, match funding community investments into community organisations. So for every pound uh, the community put in, um, then a pound comes in through the match pot. But the important thing is Community Shares, it's not a, it's not a grant or a donation. Um, it is a, a form of repayable finance that basically binds the, 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 the person to the organisation through an investment, a very patient, flexible investment. Um, and we're seeing it used more and more uh, across the UK uh, as a way to fund uh, a largely asset-based projects. And more, we've seen a number of projects uh, in the heritage and um, the high street space, uh, a lot of community hubs, art centres, that kind of thing. So again, I'll talk about that um, through the session. Um, but yeah, just the, the, I'm always really keen to draw on, on real life examples. And so I just wanted to, uh, the, I'll be talking about two projects 
um, uh, mainly um, this afternoon. So I'm just going to be that there. Yeah. So um, first one is I've been a uh, board member of uh, Stretford Public Hall in Manchester um, for six years. Um, and um, this essentially is, uh, was, a, um, was uh, built in 1878 by John Rylands, uh, local industrialist. Um, and he actually built it for the, the, the community of Stretford. It then had many different lives over the last 150 years, nearly. Um, uh, but came into council ownership uh, and then um, essentially we, the community, it was uh, at risk of being sold as the council kind of consolidated their um, estate. And uh, we, the community kind of got together to mobilize to try and save the building from going into private ownership. Uh, and undertook a community asset transfer in 2015. Uh, and we were able to buy uh, the building for the princely sum of £10. Uh, and we've been running it as a community um, hub from, from that point on. Uh, just in terms of, it, it really is a community hub. So the idea is it's a space where the community come together and engage in health and well-being, arts, um, uh, we have workspace, uh, community events. So it's really like become like a real focal point for Stretford, which is really um, historically has suffered from a lack of a kind of uh, district center. It has a big main road running through it. Um, and then just in the summer, we actually just uh, uh, finished the renovation of the ballroom with uh, support from AHF and uh, as one of the funders along with Power to Change. Um, but we also did a community share offer uh, from our community that raised uh, £255,000 uh, from over 800 members that um, brought this ballroom back to life. And this has become a kind of really important part of our um, running the building because we've now got a, a, a big 400 capacity space where we can put events, weddings, conferences, and that's really helping us become a sustainable enterprise um, for the long term. The other um, project I just want to I will talk a little bit about is just over in in neighboring Chilton. So these are both neighborhoods just outside of Manchester, about three miles from the city center. Um, and this project is slightly different. It's one, we're still in development. So we're still in negotiation with, if you can see there, the, the, it's currently owned by the co-op funeral care. Um, but actually it's a, for, a former um, cinema that actually played host to the first ever Bee Gees um, performance when they were uh, yeah, <laughs> they were actually at that point known as the rattlesnakes. Um, I think they had like a combined age of about 30. They were very young. Um, so um, uh, the idea here is um, the co-op are selling the building and, and as a community group, as a land trust, we're trying to renegotiate to purchase it and turn it into a community owned food hall with a residential space. Uh, we're working with a development partner. So the idea here is it's the community working in conjunction with a developer. It's a big project, I think probably sort of 10 million pound capital project. Um, and we're kind of waiting uh, every day to kind of get the green light from the co-op. And the idea is we'll be doing a community share offer to raise some of the funds that will go towards this project. So um, I'll talk a, a bit of the, about my experience around community engagement during on these projects. Um, because again, I just feel like it's good to have the theory, but actually understanding how it works in practice is hopefully helpful as well. So yeah, I'm sorry there's a very strong Manchester bent to this afternoon. I apologize, but as Mancunians, we generally don't apologize about that. So, uh, <laughs> but I will this time. Um, so um, yeah, so I suppose the first thing that I, I just want to talk about around community engagement, I think the thing that drives any project is the idea of you, you need to understand what your community purpose that, um, underpins what you're doing because you can have all the you know you can undertake a whole manner of community engagement activities but if you don't really understand what the community are mobilizing around then it's actually quite hard to win sort of the hearts and minds of your community um, and so the work we've done around because um, thinking about community cooperatives and how do you get people to want to become members and investors of community organizations. We start with this idea of, well, what is the community purpose? And we started to break that down and actually it has different nuances and it's sometimes useful to think about those nuances 
because that can help your messaging and help how you kind of go out and sell the vision, sell the idea to your community. So we have this kind of overriding community purpose. So why do we do it? Why do we want um, to, to see this thing happen in reality, whether that's taking over a cinema or a theater or a shop or a pub or a football club or there's, you know, there's something that is a reason why we do it. But that's often what, what underpins that is this idea of an identity. So some of that's driven by who, how the community think of themselves. So with Stretford Public Hall, it's all about being from Stretford and basically thinking we're in the north part of Trafford, which is quite an affluent borough, but it's quite a mixed pockets of, dis, of deprivation. And there was a view that in Stretford that we got ignored by big, glossy regeneration schemes. So there's a kind of strong kind of identity. Um, but then often it's not just an identity that's around career, it's, it's about what you do with that. So um, it's about, you know, what, what's the kind of activity that, that, that comes with that identity. And it, and it should say with the idea, sometimes it is geographical. So it's, you know, people from a certain place, but sometimes it can be a community interest that brings people together. So they might be geographically distributed, but they have a shared passion. And um, some examples that I've seen that very clearly is um, in community energy. So you'd often get community energy projects that will have a small, often maybe quite a small, modest local membership, but they've got a broader membership from across the country because they, they, their interest is in promoting renewable energy, community energy. Um, I think from a heritage, um, we've seen it quite a lot in heritage railway projects that have brought together members and investors from uh, across the country because they have an interest in bringing back uh, railway um, rather than they might not have much of a link or connection to that place, but it's the interest. Um, and then obviously with buildings, often there is the building itself and that, you know, what we're doing is we're bringing this building back to life. Um, so, um, uh, so when thinking about community engagement, I, I think it's quite useful to just use this framework to, to, to just go through this. And I was actually going to, because it's a workshop, there is some audience participation, if you can bear it just a little bit. Um, so I was just going to ask if you just want to chat to your immediate neighbor or in a group. I was just going to get you just very quickly, one, two minutes, just to think about a project that you're involved in and just break it down into these, um, uh, I suppose, categorizations. So why are you doing it? Who the community is, what is the task, are there any geographic boundaries or key assets that drive it. So if I just give you one to two minutes just to chat in your kind of, either in your groups, sort of, I know you've made kind of in, informal tables or just your neighbor, um, just to get us kind of a bit of audience participation going, if that's okay. <laughs>
Okay. Okay. Sorry. I know there's lots of good conversation, which is good, but there's lots of, we're going to be doing lots of these like micro discussions, so there'll be plenty of time. Um, I'm just interested. Was that was that a useful was that a useful way of thinking about the community purpose or the community or did it kind of was it you sort of already knew it and it was just a re way of reframing what you already knew? Did anyone have any thoughts or did it not work particularly or did it just needed more time? Yeah, we always need more time. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well that's interesting because that I think that. It, Obviously, that's an important part of it, but I think that is sometimes not to get to realize that often, obviously, the asset is important, but then it's thinking about how that plays out on the emotional identity. Because that's sometimes the way that you bring, you know, people have a strong relationship with the building, but it will have, it'll be because it evokes other things, memories of knowing the building before, or interests, or thinking about where they live. So, so it's quite useful to just, it, it, when coming, to, thinking about community engagement to just, I, that, that's my, my feeling when we've done community engagement around the assets that we've, you know, we've, we've got people to talk about their experiences of the hall when they were, they'd Stretford Public Hall because it was used for kind of community events and think what it was like, what it's like to be living in Stratford and what's good about it and so, but yeah, I totally agree that it is, yeah, naturally and especially in this audience, it's always going to be a key feature. Yeah. Right? And yeah. The building, but actually recognizing that the people are assets is very mm. important. And, it, and, that, and obviously, when we will come on to, you know, why are we doing community engagement, you know, and, and actually we want to get people involved on the journey and benefit from all the amazing, you know, things that people can bring time, energy, enthusiasm, skills, investment. So, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's really important. So, okay. Sorry to move us on, but um, I'm yeah. Just uh, we'll but we'll we'll speak again. Anyway, so the the next bit I'm going to just talk about is about how sort of groups come together, and um, and I don't know if anyone's seen that video. Um, it's at like a music festival in Canada, and one person starts dancing like slightly, like very very confidently and flamboyantly, and he's just on his own, and he's just dancing, and then suddenly another person joins him, and then a few more. And that is a bit what community engagement is like, is you're just dancing in a field on your own, and you're just hoping that people will come and join you. <laughs> um, and and, that, and, that, and, and it's, I think it's important to sort of realize that, that that is essentially what we're trying to do, is we're trying to get people to believe in the same thing that we believe in, that we think is a good thing, and, and how we bring people together. So, so you know, on the right, the, you know, this is just, just to, you know, how often that, that comes together is that you often start with that idea that we can do something. And that can be from an individual. Or even, and then you bring together a group of enthusiasts. And then it has to get a little bit more formal because you've then, you know, you start engaging in taking an idea into reality. And you've got to have conversations with people and... Um, so then you've got like roles and responsibilities that start to come in, but it's still quite informal. And then, you know, then it potentially you have to constitute it because you suddenly, are, you know, having to access support and finance and need a vehicle to do that. And then, um, and then obviously you get into that kind of operational um, stage. But at that founding point, it's useful to think about, um, uh, you know, what, 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 how do we get that founding group to mobilise? Because most projects will you know, have that as a key characteristic. Um, so, you know, again, that sort of purpose idea, you know, have you, is there a shared vision? Um, are they focusing on the same assets? Does everyone understand and support the community model? So that founding group, will, you know, if there's a strong kind of consensus there, that will help spread the message wider. And then obviously there's an always like an, an element of leadership. You know, you always need people who are gonna drive things, make things happen. Um, and then actually think, you know, the other thing is think about how, you know, one thing that we talk a lot about in co-ops and community enterprises actually is people should be able to 
have a livelihood and doing, you know, this the whole idea is we're setting up enterprises and people should be able to um, create a livelihood and work and, you know, it's a trading business and it's, but it's always upfront to work out who wants to potentially, you know, get involved in it from a, a professional point of view. Um, and then obviously, like anything is like the competencies, do you have the, the, um, the, the shared competencies and skills that are needed as you go down that kind of, because as it gets more formal, those things start to, to play, play their role. So that, that, that will, um, you know, that, that, that's like a, you know, that com that's a common way of seeing how um, groups kind of form and mobilize. But one thing that we see in co-ops is how when you bring your community um, uh, into in to, to sort of get involved with you, that how that can, they can have so many different hats. And I, that's one of the things that is sort of in, important um, that we talk about. So, so when we when we think often the work we do is we, we work with communities who will take on projects and they'll set it up as a, a what's called a community cooperative. But really, at the, at the centre of it is it's just that it's owned and controlled by the community and it serves a community purpose. And so, um, and it's it's driven by memberships. The idea is you want as many people to become members because then they have a stake in the organisation. Um, and then that brings so many added, sort of so many added qualities. And, and that, because basically they can have all these roles. They can be an investor, they can be a customer, they can use the services, they can be activists, they can be volunteers, they can be employees, supply, suppliers, management committee members. And really the, the reason why that's so powerful is because it, it basically prov provides the organization with competitive advantage. It, it helps that organization perform as a business it helps it become sustainable because you basically get lots of benefits by bringing your community in as members that if they weren't members, you, would, you, you wouldn't get that added value. So a big part of community shares is basically if you ask your community to be your investors, they generally will uh, are more likely to invest on a lower rate of return than you might get if you were going to a bank or another institution. Um, they might be more willing to ride the waves of risk <laughs> that you will undoubtedly go through. Um, but then, you know, not only are they investors, but they, they're going to be customers, they're going to be loyal customers, they're going to want to see the organisation survive by trading with it. Um, they will use the services and facilities. They're often your best advocates and campaigners and marketeers, that power of word of mouth, your members are your, you know, people going out and talking about how great this project is, how great this initiative is. Another really powerful thing is that pe there's been quite a lot of research that says that actually community organisations benefit from higher levels of volunteering, which then reduces often the operational costs of the organisation because you've got more people who are willing to put their time in. Now, there are obviously some ethical dilemmas around, you know, how much should you be... Um, uh, you know, relying on volunteer effort um, rather than paid roles. But as a, you know, there is a sort of fundamental kind of view that actually you'll, by giving people a stake, they're more likely to want to give up their time. Um, and then equally suppliers that you use may give more favorable rates and you'll be able to access the skills and uh, you'll need at the management committee sort of board level. Um, by sort of allowing your members to participate in that way. So, um, I just wanted to, I mean, some of these projects you might be familiar with, but these are just a few that I just, um, just wanted to uh, uh, flag as being kind of community cooperatives that have used that model. Um, so, Calder Valley CLT in Hebden Bridge and Tomenden, um, have they've recently just been a share offer for Field and Hall. Um, there's Jubilee Pool down in Penzance in Cornwall that have, the, I think, the first community-owned Lido. Um, but if anyone knows of another community-owned Lido, <laughs> let me know. Um, there's uh, South Gen in Southwold in Sussex that have taken over a, an old hospital, um, and that's now um, a community hub and housing development, and then Warwick Bridge Corn Mill in Cumbria. So these are examples where they've brought these assets back to life, built a membership, and kind of raised investment and they're, and they're, and they're ultimately they are they recognize that they they built a more sustainable business model on the basis that they'll have strong engagement with their members 
Um, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the, that's kind of where possibly organizations want to get to, but what are the steps to get there? So I'm just going to talk about community building as a kind of methodology. Um, and this, we have this um, kind of pyramid that we think about um, when we're thinking about community building. So you, at the bottom rung of the pyramid, you've got your community, this amorphous kind of group of people that, um, that live or are going to be kind of rubbing up against the, the project or the initiative that you're involved in. Um, and then from that, you want to attract an audience. Um, and once you've got your audience, then you want to convert those and, and recruit them as supporters. And then possibly you want to not, not have this kind of informal support base, but you want to have some kind of formal transactional or kind of membership relationship with, with, with your community. And basically, you can, these are kind of steps that um, it's worth think, you know, getting to the top where you've got a group of very mo active uh, members. You can't go straight there. there you, you know, there is a step-by-step -step process to build that kind of ladder of engagement, which some of you may have come across, of kind of moving people on uh, and getting them more interested and involved. Um, so... So with all, with all these things, it's always quite useful to just think about what your target community is. So who is it that you're interested in getting involved and um, uh, who, who do you want to kind of win the hearts and minds of, basically? Um, and quite often, it's about un not understanding the scale of the community, but also the, the, the characteristics, so the demographic features of that community. Um, so... Um, and that, that will help you kind of understand your, that will help, understanding the community at large will help you then think about how do we build an audience from that community. Um, so we, we did a bit of uh, work around just thinking about community enterprise and scale um, that I just was going to share. Um, so again, this is based on a lot of the community cooperatives we've we've supported and seeing that they kind of operate at different scales and different business models often work uh, more effectively at different scales. So it was, um, we, we looked at number of households and based on that, so the idea of a level one community would be anywhere up to two and a half thousand households. That would often be like a village or a parish or a neighborhood quite a tightly bound, fair, relatively small um, like, um, geography. Then we had a level two community, which was more your towns and districts, um, up to 25,000 households, and then um, your cities, and then your kind of uh, regions. Um, and we, we, we did a bit of research into the kinds of enterprises and models that kind of correlate with those to think about it when you're doing, sort of thinking about how big your community possibly is around the project you're doing. Um, so I don't know if you can read that, it's quite small, but um, basically there was a, a number of amenities that would, you, would, um, you would find at that kind of uh, level one. So uh, shops and pubs, um, taxi services, so like retail. Um, and, and the characteristics there often are that you've got the, the community itself is quite unitary, so it, 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 it's, it's got quite clear boundaries, most people will recognize each other. There's quite strong social capital. Um, and most people use the same services. Um, the, as, you get, get, as you get into that bigger conurbation, then other, thing, other services and um, kind of uh, sort of work at that level. So primary schools, GP practices, football clubs. Um, and again, that's where you have more um, pluralistic identities. So suddenly you're engaging with different tribes rather than potentially one tribe. And so then that changes how you might think about your community engagement because it might be that you can't just have, if you're trying to engage a community at that scale, you might, you might have to think more about your messaging, not just have one sort of message. Um, and then obviously as you get a bigger um, you're, you're going to have more diverse identities and more structural inequalities and how you navigate that with, with your community engagement. Um, 
So some of this is quite obvious, but um, what we found is that basically some community services need to be delivered at a larger scale. So renewable energy, even affordable housing now, there seems to be a view that you've got to engage a wider community and have a wider kind of um, base to interact with it uh, than say something like a shop or a pub. Um, and then there's certain community services that can only find scale at large, larger communities because of they might have, there's that kind of strong community of interest. So actually, you know, you, if you couldn't just focus, say, bringing back a, a heritage railway just on the, the, the location that it's located in. You'd have to go out um, because it's a, maybe a more niche interest. Um, and the other thing just to, to be aware of is that actually quite a lot of things that are happening in in the economy, although it's, I think this is a bit of a footnote now because actually I think we've seen a bit of a response against this, especially with the response to the pandemic, is that there has been a kind of view of kind of economies of scale. So that have been pushing against the idea of localized smaller services. So pub chains, larger GP practices, village shops. Um, I think helpfully actually there's been a bit of a counter to that and people are now realizing the value of having more independent, locally orientated uh, businesses and services. But again, you know, if, you're, if your business model or you're the project that you're doing, um, you know, it's worth thinking about what's the scale of the community that really, you really need to make this survive. And then that will inform your community engagement. It will, in, it will inform how far and wide you have to go out and bang the drum for that project. Um, so, I was just going to let you have another couple of minutes just to um, using, I can bring that, I'll put that table back on, but I'm just interested to know just if you go back to your kind of informal groups about whether that, you know, what the projects you're involved in, where would they fit within that kind of scale? Um, so yeah, just two minutes, if that's right. I'll, I'll put that back on. Oh, actually, I don't know. I can't actually go back, so you'll just have to remember it. Yes. 
Do you, okay, do you want more time? A bit more time? Or you, can I bring you to a close? Sorry. I did give you a bit more time that time, sorry. Um, yeah, so how did you get on with, I'm interested to know how, how many people felt that was, you could easily put your kind of project in that, in a kind of scale or, or was it, is it a bit more nebulous <laughs> in reality? <laughs> Or is it, or it's a pretty good reality check. It's just been talked about the size of the community and whether the suggested end use is, is appropriate given yeah. the scale of that community. And, and did you get the impression it probably was, or is it you feel that there might be a, a str the, um, pre Oh, okay, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I should say that in a way, it, I don't think anything's like there's not an existential problem that if you have a project that you feel the community, like, in it is not, you know, it doesn't correlate exactly because it just means that you've got to think about capturing more of your community, a greater proportion of them. If you're starting from a smaller base, then, you know, you've really got to get them. And, and that, but the thing is often that, like in, you'll find in like villages and um, places with quite strong um, kind of identities with strong boundaries, you'll find kind of 90% of the residents become members of the community pub because you know they really can capture everyone because there's um but it does mean you've got to think about actually or do we have to try and build a kind of supporter base that is has you know when we talked about uh, community purpose that they might not be located they might not have a strong identity through geography but they might be have a an interest in it around you know especially with heritage i think you i think heritage is really a good opportunity where you can kind of straddle their kind of local community and then the kind of uh, community of interest but understanding the scale kind of gives you an idea of how much do you have to go into the community of interest rather than the local community and what does that mean for the business model so yeah, yeah go for it <laughs> yeah yeah that's really interesting Yeah, and, and, and actually faith groups is a good example of where we, we do see projects where, where there's a faith component, even if it's a sort of heritage faith that you naturally can uh, tap into a bigger uh, a community of interest that extends beyond the immediate geography. Um, yeah, do you have a point? Um, yeah, by coincidence, I was on the list. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mar Marston, oh, Marston, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Yeah. And that Absolutely. You've got all the operational aspects of engage yeah, with working understanding your customer base, your community base. Yeah. yeah. But that you know, the, the money they bring is real potential. As yeah. Well. I think the other thing oh sorry. And the other thing that's probably worth what we've seen is that often it's former residents of your locality will participate, it'll get involved because it's a way that they can, especially if they grew up, you know, your formative years, you have those fond memories of somewhere. So often you find that when we've looked at our kind of, at Stretford Public Hall, when we looked at our kind of map of investors and members, like we've got obviously 80% in Stretford, but there's 20% are it, you know, quite far and wide, but most of them are like, oh, I grew up in Stretford or my nan lived in Stretford and that. So you, that's, there's also that element as well. That it's not just your kind of present residents and households, it's those that have a connection. Um, so, so hopefully that gave you a kind of, you know, that's the starting point, thinking about the scale and the sort of nature of the community. And then, so once you've done that, um, oh, hang on, I'm going the wrong way now. How have I done that? I might need some technical assistance. Oh, wait, wait, I think it's going in the right direction. There we go. It just got confused. That's okay. There we go. 
So basically, the next step is to find all these unknown people that live in your community or you've identified as being, you know, will potentially have an interest and get them to find out about your initiative because unfortunately, at the, the starting point, it's likely that only you, your founding group and your friends and family <laughs> know about it. Um, so that you've got to try and build an audience. So that's basically get people to know about you and your, your project. And that usually happens from people seeing something, reading something, hearing something, or witnessing something. So um, you've got to try and make that happen. Um, and most of these things are typical things that we probably know um, and you know come across when we interact with anything from marketing and advertising. But yeah, just to kind of um, run down the ways that you can do this. So, you know, one of the, what, a great way is basically press and media coverage because it's generally free. You don't have to pay for it if you can convince a journalist to write about what you're doing. Um, obviously now organizing events, physical events is coming back, but obviously virtual events, have, you know, people have been doing campaigns in the digital space. Public meetings, obviously we'll come on to kind of how we use the digital space around community engagement. Shared personal networks, leafleting, networking through other organizations and social media. So these are all the ways that you can get people to know about you and what you're doing. And I just kind of, you know, just to give you kind of examples of what, you know, how we did that on some of the projects that we, um, so, this is the picture house. So we had a, a useful little hook, which was the Bee Gees. Um, and it did really help get press coverage because, um, you know, the jury's out on their musical output, but they do have a big fan base. Uh, <laughs> um, so we, were, we did get quite a lot of press coverage, um, even though it was quite a tenuous link, the building has the Bee Gees. Um, and, and, and with that, we managed to like pull out a few musical, um, like like wheel out some of the musical kind of uh, celebs. There's Clint Boone on the on that picture down there. Does anyone know Clint Boone? Yeah, got a Clint Boone fan here in Spiral Carpets. Um, but yeah, we basically did a big press kind of push to get people interested in this using the Bee Gees as a hook. Um, but we then also complemented that with really local. We did loads of leafleting. Um, we went to Park Runs, a really good place to get a lot of people, like, there's, there's Park Runs all over the country, and people are generally, like, when they've just finished a Park Run, they're feeling quite good and upbeat, and, and you, if you just give them a flyer then, they generally, it's just like a perfect time to, like, get them involved. Um, and we got our local MP to kind of get behind it, you know, that kind of political, and then we, did, we made, you know, tangible things, like, a, we, got, we pulled in some architects to, like, build a um, a model of what it could look like. Um, and so, um, you know, trying to hit all those different ways of, uh, we've got some radio coverage, got some TV coverage. Um, so again, it's trying to, and I say you can't do enough of, of, you know, you want to, people need to hear it 10 times. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, most of it was volunteer. It was just volunteer driven, but we and, and getting like the architects to just like just convincing the local architects to just do it pro bono. Um, but we did have a small, uh, a couple of small grants. Um, the the community land trust we had um, uh, a, a grant from the um, national community land trust network around community engagement of the scheme. So yeah, having it. But I would say like we with. You don't need a lot. I think we had like one or two grand and that just, you know, pr printed the flyers and then everything else was just like mobilizing volunteers. Um, and, and like I say, the press was free. So that just, but yeah. And, and, and actually, you, you know, if you need to kind of, sometimes doing a crowd, like a small crowd fund or donation drive to get a bit of that, you know, you bring people in, get a bit of funding, get people to, but, and then you've got some resources to do some of that engagement. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then equally, 
um, Straight for Public Hall was similar. Um, we did a lot of street-based leafleting. So this was at the point where we were trying to campaign to save the building and basically get an opportunity to engage with the council around the asset transfer. So again, photo calls. Again, buildings really help. You can get in front of them and, and you know, and they're kind of, you know, they're photogenic in whatever, you know, in depend, irrespective of the condition they're in, they're sort of photogenic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we really need to choose the after. Yeah, I know. I did actually have a sunny one, but that one was more dramatic. I went for the cloudy one. And also, that's more typical of a Manchester day. So, but, uh, yeah, you're right. Sunny, getting nice sunny shots is probably better. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's right. I see. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's quite, it's like the before and after. Often they have like a grainy kind of, yeah. So yeah, using all the, the techniques of um, cutthroat marketers is definitely useful. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, I, so once you've, you've done this campaign and you're basically trying to get people you don't know to know about you, the next step is to know about them because it's all well and good that they know about you, but at some point you're gonna have to go back to those people that know about you to ask them for things, volunteer, become, you know, become supporters. And so you've got to capture information about them. And, and, then, and, it, and basically, you know, it's just thinking about all those activities you do, how, how are you going to get information about those people that are potentially supporters? Because that's basically, that's how you go from an audience, a sympathetic or audience to supporters, because you can contact them and they've, They've, they've been willing to give you their contact details, which implicitly means, unless you've really like put them in a corner and <laughs> strung up and into it, they probably are supportive of what you're doing. They're a supporter. So, you know, all these things are fairly, um, you know, common sense, but it's just, you know, it's just, I, you know, we forget all the time, like, oh, we haven't got any forms to capture email addresses, you know, and it's so important because that might be the only time you get with them and then they're gone. So you know, every moment you can to capture people's information. Um, and obviously, um, you know, there's all the GDPR kind of things around um, policies and, but I, someone told me about this, that actually, yes, you have to be mindful of, you know, getting people's consent, but actually the likelihood is that because this is a community driven thing, like people are, you know, you, I wouldn't say you have to be too fearful of the GDPR implications because you're not selling trainers or diet pills or, you know, people understand that you're, you know, this is something that's coming from a community position. So my, I don't know if this should be, but my view is, you know, don't get wound up or tangled up with thinking about GDPR. Like if people are voluntarily giving their information to you then they've consented and they're not going to mind if you then contact them around this campaign i don't know if anyone's shares that experience but that's my view is that it's generally okay <laughs> that's true yeah and i totally understand depending on the environment you're working in that can be more bound up with protocols um but so one of the things I just wanted to say that I've been very wary of working on these campaigns is that the use of technology and how obviously now so many people are becoming supporters through social media, liking, follows, and, 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 and all this contact information coming in from all different angles. And suddenly you have like, you know, bits of, uh, you know, sign up sheets here and uh, likes there. And, and there's a, you know, there's a view that if you want to really like manage that effectively is to get to this, what's called single source of, source of truth. So you've got one place where all your data is going in. You've got all your contact details, information about them, what they're, you know, if they've identified what action they've taken. And so one of my big kind of uh, encouragements is to have some kind of database CRM system, even at the beginning, even if it's just really quite rudimentary because it is so helpful then to then plot the next steps. Um, and I just wanted to um, uh, sh show you an example of what we kind of 
crafted together and it, like it wasn't particularly like the most smoothest um you know uh system that we got but we did put together a kind of rudimentary system for making sure that we captured all the right information around the picture house um so the thing with the picture house is we knew that we wanted people not to only to say that they wanted to see this building saved and turned into a kind of community space, but we knew that we were going to at some point need to ask them for some funding. So we actually did a pledging campaign. That was our main call to action. We weren't actually taking anyone's funding because it was still very um, uncertain about whether we'd get the chance to take the building on. But we, we thought that it was a really good idea to just get people's pledges. So basically we had lots of entry points where we had flyers and the media and word of mouth, but we were basically pushing everyone to our like website, which had a pledge form on it. Um, and then we were basically getting people to pledge on that. And then we've been, um, which we just used a little form tool. There's lots available free, most of them are free. Um, and then we were tagging people based on whether they did, because we, even though it was a pledge form, we did say, look, if you can't pledge or you're not in a position to, or you just want to be informed, um, let us know. And we basically collected that information and then put it into, we just, again, like a, an email marketing system or CRM system. So we're just using MailChimp, but we've basically funneled everyone, got their contact details, tagged them. So we know if they're a pledger or a member of the CLT, or if they just want to stay informed. And so we now can go back to them and update them and so and we know that more and more people like the first our lives are being played out digitally more and more is the first so it you know it is you can't ignore it having having some kind of system to just manage that i i we found has been really really helpful as part of that community engagement because we've got a thousand pledges now for this so it's you know it's a, we it's a lot of data we need to kind of to, to sort of manage that, so. Um, so, yeah, I, again, just, just maybe a couple of minutes, um, just, yeah, just to talk within your groups about, um, you know, what, what, you, what your experience is of the conversion rate. So, from your community, how many people, you know, are you likely to you be in your audience? How would you then convert them into supporters and, what campaigns you think would be, you know, what, which of those kind of techniques or kind of activities you think would be the most effective in your community to, because that's what you're trying to do is convert. If you start with 20,000 households, how many of those can you get on your um, supporter list? Um, in, in Stratford, we, we, there's about 10,000 households. We got about 5,000 people signed up on our, you know, we, we managed to find out about them. <laughs> and then we, from those, we got about 800 members. So you can see that it, it does go down, but you, you know, you can get to a point where you can get a strong enough supporter base and a membership base to then um, make it viable. So yeah, I'll just give you a couple of minutes just to chat through that, if that's okay.
Okay. Sorry to stop you in your tracks. Um, so, uh, yeah, interested. Has anyone got anything that um, any uh, anything that really that sparked in terms of thinking about this kind of conversion from community to audience to supporter? Is that did that resonate with any or? Is it just, you're just going to try and hit as many people <laughs> and hope for the best? <laughs> Which actually is, you know, is, is, there is always an element of that, I should say. You know, it's useful to consider these things, but there's an element that you, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it, I, and again, I think it's, you know, that's the thing, you've got to remember that, that, that the flight, that, that's getting people to find out about the Heritage Trail and what you're doing. So that is really a great, you know, you, you can't kind of like un write that off as an important way, but it's then thinking about, okay, well, how do we then get to know those people? And, you know, and then it's just like you say, finding the right um, method to try and capture people's details. Yeah. Yeah, and th and that's the thing that we found is that me, you know, everyone thinks like the, you know, conventional media is dying and it's, you know, it's. But we found that actually, media, it, local, regional, even national media is 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 one of the most powerful ways. And that's not because, you know, people, it's so persuasive. <laughs> it's more that people get that it really builds a sense of pride and that something they know about is in the media so it's like it's like boosts that kind of oh my you know like you know i remember when we got press around um the public hall it was like oh you know because the only thing you'd hear about stretford were just like the negative things and it was just like oh there's actually a positive story about this and it, and and it was it was so i i think like media press and media is so powerful to just get people to go oh wow like i actually this is something i care about um did, did anyone else have any other? In terms of yeah. discussing it in the context of kind of high street action zones, yeah. that if you manage to get 2% of your property owners to engage and take up grant, that's two buildings out of 100. Are you really going to see the impact of doing up two shop fronts on a you know, huge length of high street? Yeah, and, and obviously there's different, I appreciate in different contexts that kind of that method of, oh, if you only get a small, yeah, it plays out differently. Um, but at the same time, I think it's also, again, that sort of shows that you, that conversion has to be higher. You've got to get to it, and then it just is like, okay, so we have to just do more to. Um, so, so, so I think that's what, what we found. So we've started in February, and we put out posts within the week of the Open Theatre's Trust. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, where we got to, we have a CRM, we've got about 80 people on there that, that have either signed up because they want to volunteer, they want the newsletter, or they just nosy. Yeah. Uh, and we asked them what they've got, we asked the skills in terms of what they're able to offer, so just about to offer a role to someone to do the heritage piece. But from those thousands of people we've had, I've offered one role as a volunteer. We have a public meeting in July, 35 people looked at the invite, but didn't actually submit and say yes, I want to come. Okay, okay. yeah. We've got 22 on the call. So we've got about 1,000 followers on Facebook, that's really all we do, because um, we're rubbish, I mentioned that. So 
So from a thousand down to twenty two at the, the public meeting, we've then got two or three really keen people and we've got one person that we want to give some work to as a volunteer. So it, that, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and it, and it's working and I think yeah, you know you sort of will know already that actually, you know, because you know, the fact that even people have just like liked your Facebook page, they've 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 done something that indicates they are interested in it. They're not no, that's true. But 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 you but the thing is at the moment that's quite you you can't they're still quite an amorphous. So you 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 know, the idea is just just trying different techniques, just get a little bit, you know, if you can get their email address, then you know, that email marketing, which is often one of the most powerful ways of um uh, and then, so it's, yeah, those steps to just, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's once you've got their contact details is, I feel, is a big step. If they're willing to give you, say, I'm willing for you to... But, but also the why yeah. of so yeah. I, I know why I've got the because they want to offer, yeah. to paint the building. Yeah. It's not the other crazy new, yeah. new paint needs more than yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we know why they've just signed up. Yeah, and exactly, that's, and getting that understanding of what's... Dri and driving people like, and in the in the beginning, you know, getting as many people like the volunteer aspect is is massive because obviously that development phase is really hard to get funding. So as much kind of pro bono volunteer effort is is, is definitely powerful. So yeah. Yeah. And, and do you think there's, because obviously there are different motivations, but often there's sort of an underlying thing about s seeing, a, you know, seeing a project or a space become back into use or have greater, you know, so it's essentially quite trying to find that sort of common denominator. There's, there's often an overriding yeah. thing like that, that is, obviously it has to be a Yeah, I mean, that is, that is a hard thing to, you know, it's almost, you know, uh, that might, I don't know if you could sort of say that that's something that we're working towards and we hope, but at the, at the beginning, so it's a two-way relationship, but the sequencing of it is slightly, because, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's most, yeah, projects we've, that, that I think is the key, is that it does have to start with that bottom-up approach, and it is very difficult to manufacture that, um, you know, through. Um, so, yeah, it's not, I, I agree, it's not easy to, um, you know, where there is a feeling there has to be some kind of transactional relationship, it's quite difficult because at the, in the early stage there isn't really much there other than an idea of something. And I just think that's sort of selling that idea and that vision of what the potential and hopefully that's enough to get people to participate. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I suppose, yeah, capturing that is important, understanding that. Um, Okay, so I was going to just take like a five-minute break. Um, cause the
because basically this first bit is, I suppose, more around community engagement in the development stage of getting a project up and running. But then I was going to talk a little bit about community engagement within a kind of active project and, and how a project or a venture kind of continues to engage um, and, 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 how it, and how that kind of um, links into, um, uh, you know, your, your neighbourhood and some of the regeneration programmes and, and the kind of statutory strategic position. So, um, yeah, I'll just, what's the time now? If we just have a five minute comfort break, is that right? If we just come back at uh, five, to, five to three? Or maybe just, yeah, three, ten to three. Just two or three minutes. Sorry, because I think I, I think I need to finish. I need to finish at quarter past. Or can we go a little bit further? Okay, yeah, just have yeah five minutes. That'd be good. Okay, cheers. <laughs>
Okay, we'll just do we just got a last 15 minutes, I think, if people are all right to hang on. Doing very well, everyone. <laughs> um, sorry? It is, Friday, it is Friday and Friday afternoon. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, I was just going to talk about um, obviously the first bit was about hopefully the idea of how do you engage community in that development stage where you're trying to get a project or a venture up and running. But there is, I think, quite a different, um, a different approach and a sort of different sensibility around community engagement once you're kind of up and running and then you're having to then engage with other parts of, of your community or local authorities or different agencies. So I just was going to talk a little bit about our experience of that kind of community engagement um, once you're kind of up and running. Um, so I was just going to um, talk a little bit about Stratford Public Hall and our experience of the, the there's a big regeneration program happening um, in Stratford. Um, it's being delivered by the local authority, Trafford Council, in partnership with Bruntwood. Is anyone from Bruntwood here? <laughs> or Trafford Council, for that matter. Um, <laughs> um, and so this has been really interesting for us because we've basically, we're, we're just here. And then this is, we have this old shopping centre that's all being re reconfigured and different parts and and suddenly we're kind of engaging now within we um a, a lot of our initial um efforts and attention was about saving the building and very much focused on the building and less on how we correspond although that obviously happens informally but now we're we're really kind of integrated into this wider place making and regeneration um in stretford um and one of the main reasons is because this is, we've got this really, um, this main road that runs right through Stretford and then another big road. So we're quite cut off, but there's a lot of an opportunity. This is going to be a reconfigured kind of district centre with new shopping street housing. And so we're really interested now about how the hall, how we speak to this and how, and how as a community space, how we kind of form part of this um, master plan and what's quite interesting is at the same time that we've been kind of engaged in this we've also been thinking about um, the building and how we can expand because we've got um, quite you know positively we've got lots of people who want to use the space and we really need to kind of expand if we can and we've got a basement that's kind of being underutilized um, so um, basically yeah we really start with the basement we've got this kind of cavernous basement that's got it's like it's dry but it's apart from, uh, other uh, other than that it's like you wouldn't want to spend too much time down there basically um but it's it is a, it's a really large footprint and we've got the opportunity to do something quite quite uh, exciting um so we started out doing a kind of consultation with the community so we did like a, an open day and we got we had you can't really see, but we sort of asked people to put um, stickers on the kinds of things they would like to see in the basement. Um, and basically we got kind of, um, the kind of, the main kind of interest was around like live music, theater, kind of music studio, so sort of um, space. Um, so we've now been kind of, Sorry, yeah, yeah. That's right. We did also, it was loaded to a degree, but we also had space for people to um, put other ideas. And you knew they were physically feasible? Um, not, not beyond, yeah, not, not, we weren't sure. I mean, we then, based on this, we have now um, our architects and we are looking at the viability and we're doing some economic viability. So we kind of almost said, look, this is what the community wants. We hadn't done any real feasibility testing. We sort of then past that to look at how should that inform the space um, and so basically this is our kind of bold plan this is we've done some options uh, we, um, and and it's weird because obviously this doesn't you can't see this is not the basement but this allows us one to 
provide, because one of the main problems with the basement is we have no access to it. It's very bad access. We've just got a small walkway. So this, basically, the idea is that we, we can have access from the rear. They can come in and just vastly improve the access. But the other thing is we've got this opportunity to kind of, at the same time, um, do something bold with the, because just over the road, we've got this whole master plan. We've got this whole reworking of the district center. Um, and we have this kind of pocket parks. So the idea is we can expand out and link into the into the sort of regeneration of Stratford and have this exhibition space. Because we, we there's a subway here and we're using it just as like a white wall of the subway that we're just using as a, like a informal exhibition space, getting the community to do murals and things. And we thought actually we could have a formal kind of exhibition space. Um, um, and, and yeah, so this is sort of the idea of how we're now trying to, and we're working with the council and working with Brumwood to make sure that their plans align with our plans, because there's going to be elements of what they're doing that's going to impact on this. And equally, you know, they can see that we've, you know, as the, the main community centre in Stretford, that, you know, we're an important part of the future of Stretford, basically. So, um... Um, so, and the idea is that we also, it's not only that, um, the building, but actually trying to bring more green space and use this kind of weird subway area. Yeah, we, it, 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 we, we, it was kind of, we weren't sure, but the council have basically given that weird bank next to it, they've, they've said that it's, it's, so it's come under our freehold now. Um, so, yeah, so now we're looking at um, sort of creating this kind of community garden. Um, but, you know, the idea is that it, it connects this new, the idea of this new extension with Kingsway, which is that big road, which is going to be softened and, um, and it will tie in to this town centre. So the idea is that we've sort of engaged with the community initially around the basement, but now we're kind of part of the kind of um, trying to integrate ourselves within the kind of regeneration scheme at the same time. Um, and then, yeah, just the, the, other, the other aspect of um, uh, the picture house. So obviously the picture house isn't, isn't we, we're still in, really in the development phase. Um, but again, there's a kind of Chalton, mass, there's a, it, Chalton's another neighbourhood where there's quite a lot of activity and they're looking to develop the precinct, which is a, another small shopping centre. So again, we've like done quite a lot of community engagement around working out what the community need, want, what this building the pitch house can provide about how then it fits in with the wider neighbourhood. So yeah, just in terms of the, um, the campaign, we, um, we did that initial campaign where we got the pledges um, uh, but then we did quite a lot of market testing with the community to find out, okay, they know they want to save the building, but what do they want to see? What, what should happen here? Um, so we started with like themes. So we asked the community to like, before we went into like specific uses, what are the things that they want to kind of concentrate on? And we came out with these kind of four themes. So strength of community, health and well-being, the building and the environment, jobs in the local economy. Um, and then we, given it was, yeah, this was right there. Uh, <laughs> it was April, May, 2020. So it was very much a digital online engagement piece, uh, but we did some quite detailed um, survey responses. We've got about 600 responses. Um, and we actually asked people about what uses and, and that's where we started to get out this idea of this, people looking for this kind of food hall, casual dining, performance space and film. And that's really informed the plans for, for, for that building. Yeah, yeah. So basically the way we did it was because we'd got a thousand people sign up to pledge and, and we had our members, we went out to the pledges and supporters because they'd already indicated that they were interested in seeing this become a community space. So because we'd, we'd got all their contact information, we could then send out the service. So that's why it is so vital to get that, um, uh, that, those contact information, those contact details, because then we could um, yeah, do a survey and, and you know, we could, and actually loads of people wanted to get involved. So, um, 
again, it, yeah, it was just, that was basically how we did it. It was just through the campaign, yeah. Sorry, do you have a point and then I'll come to you, sorry. Yeah. yeah. You it's been, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, we've basically, I wouldn't say that, like, they'd, the, they've been really, like, open to working with us. We've had to, like, you know, kind of force our way in a bit. Um, but I think now we have, and I think there's an element that, um, again, it's finding the mutual, the mutual interest, the mutual benefit. So what's interesting is they've, the council and Brumwood have basically bought the, the shopping center and they've got future high streets funding. And so that, that whole scheme, they've kind of, they, there's quite a lot of certainty about what they can do and they're going for the planning, but then, the wider, the, the, the other parts of the master plan are still quite open-ended and they don't really know, they don't have the details. So us going and saying, actually, we want to do this with our building and actually we could do this park, but it will require you to fill in the subway. So we're almost telling them what they should do because we've, there's, there's now, because there's a bit of a, a vacuum. Where, so, you know, it's, that's been quite helpful that like they, they, there was still uncertainty and we've kind of gone there and said, look, this is what we want to do. So whether we can, you know, go navigate that is kind of, well, we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> so, sorry, did you have a point? Uh, yeah. I, no, I just wanted to say that in terms of getting people to respond to online surveys, what works for one of our projects, it's the museum and um, we appointed some consultants to do uh, development studies so they could kind of improve it and, and we really wanted to go from the community really what the barriers were and why they weren't going in there at the moment. Um, so we had an online survey that they ran and there was a chance to win a £10 Tesco voucher and we had about six, you know, loads of people respond to it that perhaps wouldn't have done so in their fee to us they'd included for those yeah. vouchers and that worked really well. It's not always an option but I mean people, the chance of winning even just £10 <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, there is, I think, quite a lot of, um, obviously, there's been a lot of market res like work done around market research techniques and how you boost uh, participation in survey fatigue. And obviously, having some kind of prize draw is often quite a way to um, incentivize people. I think what's interesting is, you know, th this almost validated the fact that we did the survey and we got such a good response without any kind of incentive, sort of validated the, the, the strength of community interest and enthusiasm. So it was like another thing that we could sort of say, like we've just um, put a, a, an application into the community ownership fund. And obviously these are the kinds of things that we could say, it's like we've got 600 responses and you know, so it helps kind of show the case that actually people are interested and engaged. Um, but you've got to get their information. So it's that again, that steps um, across. So. Um, so, I mean, that was, I don't think I really had, um, uh, the, yeah, in terms of the, the, um, the picture house, again, it's, um, it's, um, forms part of this kind of wider, um, scheme that the Manchester Council are looking at. Um, but one of the things, and we're just, just starting on this, so I don't have a huge amount of, um, experience of it, and probably people around the room, but we're looking at, um, uh, sort of neighbourhood planning around doing some, uh, and I know, I don't know if um, Nick's not here from locality because I think there's some neighbourhood, but uh, does anyone have any experience of sort of neighbourhood planning as a way of kind of engage, as a kind of process to get a more of a say in how this kind of master planning work kind of takes place? What's, what was your experience of it? <laughs> Yeah. With very, very scant resources. Um, a rather cynical view from my point of view is that it, it's, it's 
this government's chief way of doing what was done by consultants by the previous uh, government. Um, so it's very much on the cheap and, and it's a huge burden for the public, sorry, for the community. Yeah. That's definitely what we're, at the government seems we're, a, the CLT is a small organization and um, we've got a tiny bit of funding. Um, I don't know if we'll go through the formal neighborhood planning process, but at least take some of those, the disciplines of how it works to, to help give a, basically get more involved in the you kind of. Absolutely need the local authority on the same side. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Well, I was just going to mention, I wasn't just to put it per uh, personally um, working on the project, but my old organisation um, that leads a, a creative uh, enterprise called Art Council as an NGO. Okay. We're leading on a neighbourhood plan for uh, a borough just outside the city centre, which is about to sort of be swept by just... Yeah, is, what, what, what are they called? Arts? East Street Arts, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I went, I went to visit them at the um, locality conference a few years ago. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, they're a really great organisation. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Using culture as a tool, but, you know, there's quite there's a couple of very diverse community there, and obviously we should use the best language and stuff like that. So using culture as a vehicle to engage in the local community and the neighbourhood board is really a really fascinating process and a very long one that we're still. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing from this side is, again, I think the lever of saying that we've got a, built a, a support within the community around a scheme, and then that becomes, I think, quite a strong lever than if there is regeneration scheme. You know, if you're then trying to develop something within the context of something wider within locality, is just to, you know, to, to, to really like, demonstrate like what you're doing and how you're mobilizing the community. So yeah, again, this is really early days for this, so I can't, there's not really much I can kind of like comment on that's useful, but, but again, I just wanted to sort of flag that it's a, a lever that we're trying to explore. Yeah, sorry. Okay, great. We did a, a neighborhood planning exercise with one of the local councils in the West Midlands about 10 years ago. And so they were looking to re redevelop a part of one of their, their, their council estates, which was part of our, our council. And we modeled that the estate just as it comes again. Oh, wow. Okay, and cool. They look, they look residents of all ages, and we have a techie where we just drag and drop in. Yeah. Community centers, parks. Places. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I really like that. Okay, so we just need to uh, design a computer game. <laughs> cool. So, I mean, that was, yeah, I just, getting, I just wanted to sort of give you an impression of the kinds of things we're now navigating, at, you know, once we've, well, with Public Hall, we've, you know, obviously been operational for a, a, a few years now. Um, um, so I think, um, yeah, I think we've kind of covered had some of these examples and had the conversation. So really, I just wanted to um, just finish on just um, a bit of a plug for Stir to Action, really. Because <laughs> um, basically, we've got um, a series of workshops happening, um, uh, yeah, over the next six months. So I just thought I would f flash up some of those if people are interested. And all the dates and um, uh, ways to sign up is on the website. Um, uh, so um, we've got ones on community shares, um, uh, community food co-ops, worker co-ops, community businesses, how to get started. We've actually got um, a community engagement session. So if you still like have a, a, an, an unmet need for more community engagement, um, advice and support, media training, um, and uh, HR engagement, and uh, one about engaging workshops that I might need to go on. Um, so yeah, so that, that's it really. Um, so I'm going to have to make a fairly quick dash because I've got to get a train <laughs> back to Manchester, but that's my contact email. So if anyone has any questions, and I'm sure uh, Beverly will be sharing the slides and apparently there'll be an edited recording yeah. of today. Uh, and then in terms of the other workshops, if you just go to stirtoaction.com slash workshops then you'll be able to get more information there so thank you very much um
yeah, I was, it's been my first time doing one of these for like two years, so uh, it's been nice to <laughs> uh, get uh, see people face to face and uh, yeah, and enjoy the, the tour and uh, safe journey back and have a nice weekend. Thanks everyone.